Chapter Four: Brief Interviews with Hideous Men. B.I. Number Fourteen, O Eight Through Ninety Six, Saint David's P.A. It's cost me every sexual relationship I ever had. I don't know why I do it. I'm not a political person. I don't consider myself. I'm not one of these America First, read the newspaper, Will Buchanan get the nod people. I'll be doing it with some girl. It doesn't matter who. It's when I start to come that it happens. I'm not a Democrat. I don't even vote. I freaked out about it one time and called a radio show about it. A doctor on the radio anonymously, and he diagnosed it as the uncontrolled yelling of involuntary words or phrases, frequently insulting or scatological, which is coprolalia, is the official term. Except when I start to come and always start yelling it, it's not insulting. It's not obscene. It's always the same thing, and it's always so weird. But I don't think insulting. I think it's just weird, and uncontrolled. It's like it comes out the same way the spooge comes out. It feels like that. I don't know what it's about, and I can't help it. Q. Victory for the forces of democratic freedom. Only way louder, as in really shouting it, uncontrollably. I'm not even thinking it until it comes out and I hear it. Victory for the forces, democratic freedom. Only louder than that. Victory. Q. Well, it totally freaks them out. What do you think? And I just about die of the embarrassment. I don't ever know what to say. What do you say if you just shouted victory for the forces of democratic freedom? Right when you came. Q. It wouldn't be so embarrassing if it wasn't so totally fucking weird. If I had any clue about what it was about, you know. Q. Ellipses. God, now I'm embarrassed as hell. Q. But all there is is the once. That's what I mean about it costing. I can tell how bad it freaks them out, and I get embarrassed and never call them again, even if I try to explain. And it's the ones that'll act all understanding, like they don't care, and it's okay, and they understand, and it doesn't matter that embarrass me the worst, because it's so fucking weird to yell victory for the forces of democratic freedom. When you're shooting off, that I can always tell they're totally freaked out and just condescending down to me, and pretending they understand. And those are the ones where actually, I actually end up almost getting pissed off, and don't even feel embarrassed, not calling them or totally avoiding them. The ones that say, "I think I could love you anyway." B I number fifteen O eight three ninety six. MCI Bridgewater Observation and Assessment Facility, Bridgewater, MA. It is a proclivity, and provided there is minimal coercion and no real harm, it's essentially benign. I think you'll have to agree. And that there are surprisingly small number who require any coercion at all. Be apprised. Q. From a physiological standpoint, the origins appear obvious. Various therapists concur. I might add, here and elsewhere, so it's all quite tidy. Q. Well, my own father was, you might say, a man who was by natural proclivity not a good man, but who nevertheless tried diligently to be a good man, temper and so forth. Q. I mean, it's not as if I'm torturing them or burning them. Q. My father's proclivity for rage, especially unintelligible or distorted, the emergency room for the umpteenth time, afraid of his own temper and proclivity for domestic violence, this built over a period of time, and eventually he resorted after a period of time and periods of unsuccessful counseling to the practice of handcuffing his own wrists behind his back whenever he lost his temper with any of us, in the house. Domestically, small domestic incidents that try one's temper and so forth. This self-restraint 
eventually progressed over a period of time such that the more enraged he might become at any of us, the more coercively he began to restrain himself. Often the day would end with the poor man hogtied on the living room floor, screaming furiously at us to put his goddamn motherfucking gag in. Whatever possible interest that bit of history might hold for anyone not privileged to have been there. Trying to get the gag in without getting bitten. But of course, so now we can explain my proclivities and trace their origins and have everything tied up all nice and tight and tidy for you, can't we? VI number 11, 06 through 96. Vienna, VA. All right, I am. Okay, yes. But hang on a second, okay? I need you to try and understand this, okay? Look, I know I'm moody. I know I'm kind of withdrawn sometimes. I know I'm hard to be in this with, okay? All right? But this every time I get moody or withdrawn, you thinking I'm leaving or getting ready to ditch you, I can't take it. This thing of you being afraid all the time, it wears me out. It makes me feel like I have to, like, hide whatever mood I might be in, because right away you're going to think it's about you, and that I'm getting ready to ditch you and leave. You don't trust me. You don't. It's not like I'm saying, given our history, I deserved a whole lot of trust right off the bat, but you still don't at all. There is like zero security, no matter what I do, okay? I said I'd promise I wouldn't leave, and you said you believed me that I was in with you for the long haul this time. But you didn't, okay? Just admit it, all right? You don't trust me. I'm on eggshells all the time, do you see? I can't keep going around reassuring you all the time. Q. No, I'm not saying this is reassuring. What this is, is just trying to get you to see. Okay, look, things ebb and flow, okay? Sometimes people are just more into it than other times. This is just how it is. But you can't stand ebb. It feels like no ebbs allowed. And I know that's partly my fault, okay? I know the other times didn't exactly make you feel secure. But I can't change that, okay? But this is now, and now I feel like any time I'd just rather not talk or get a little moody or withdrawn, you think I'm plotting to ditch you. And that breaks my heart, okay? It just breaks my heart. Maybe if I loved you a little less or cared about you less, I could take it. But I can't. So yes, that's what the bags are. I'm leaving. Q. And I was. This is just how I was afraid you'd take it. I knew it, that you'd think this means you were right to be afraid all the time and never feel secure or trust me. I knew it'd be, see, you're leaving after all, when you promised you wouldn't. I knew it, but I'm trying to explain anyway, okay? And I know you probably won't understand this either, but wait, just try to listen and maybe absorb this, okay? Ready? Me leaving is not the confirmation of all your fears about me. It is not. It's because of them. Okay? Can you see that? It's your fear I can't take. It's your distrust and fear I've been trying to fight. And I can't anymore. I'm out of gas on it. If I loved you even a little less, maybe, I could take it. But this is killing me. This constant feeling that I'm always scaring you and never making you feel secure? Can you see that? Q. It is ironic from your point of view. I can see that. Okay? And I can see you totally hate me now. And I've spent a long time getting myself to where I'm ready to face your totally hating me for this. And this look of like total confirmation of all your fears and suspicions on your face if you could see it okay i swear if you could see your face right now anybody'd understand why i'm leaving q i'm sorry i don't mean to put it all on you i'm sorry it's not you okay i mean 
It has to be something about me, if you can't trust me after all these weeks, or stand even just a little normal ebb and flow without always thinking I'm getting all ready to leave. I don't know what, but there must be. Okay, and I know your history is not great, but I swear to you, I meant everything I said, and I've tried a hundred plus percent. I swear to God I did. I'm so sorry. I'd give anything in the world not to hurt you. I love you. I always will love you. I hope you believe that. But I'm giving up trying to get you to. Just please believe I tried. And don't think this is about something wrong with you. Don't do that to yourself. It's us. Us is why I'm leaving, okay? Can you see that? That it's not what you've always been so afraid of? Okay? Can you see that? Can you maybe see you just might have been wrong? Even possibly? Could you give me that much, do you think? Because this isn't exactly fun for me either, okay? Leaving like this, seeing your face like this as my last mental picture of you. Can you see I might be pretty torn up about it too? Can you? That you're not alone in this? B.I. number 3, 11 through 94. Trenton and J. Overheard. R. So I'm last off again, as usual, and all that business like that there. A. Yes, just wait and relax in your seat. Be the last off why everybody right away all the time has to get up the minute it stops and cram into the aisle so you just stand there with your bags all crammed in pouring sweat in the aisle for five minutes just to be the R. Just wait and finally coming out of the jetway thing and out into the you know gate area, greeting area as usual thinking, I'll just get a cab out to A. Still, but always depressing on these cold calls to come out into the gate greeting area and see everybody getting met and with the squeals and the hugs and limo guys holding up all the names on cardboard that aren't your name and the R. Just shut it for one fucking second, will you? Because listen to this because except it's mostly emptied out by the time I get out there. A. The people by this juncture are mostly all dispersed, you're saying. Are. Except for over by theirs, this one girl left over by the rope, looking in, peering, gazing in down the jetway thing there as she sees it's me as I'm looking at her, as I come out because it's emptied out except for her. Our eyes meet and all that business like that there. And what does she, she up and goes down on her knees, drops crying and with the waterworks and all the business hitting, slapping the carpet and scratching at gouging little tufts and fibers out of the cheap ass product they buy where the low polymer glue starts the backing separating almost right away and ends up tripling their 20 quarter M and R costs as I sure don't have to tell you and all bent over slapping and gouging at the product with the nails bent over so you can you know just about see her tits totally hysterical and with the waterworks and all like that there a another cheery welcome to Dayton for your fucking cold calls we're pleased too well. R. No, but the story, it turns out the story, when I, you know, go over to say, are you okay, is anything the matter, and like that, and get a better shot of I have to tell you some pretty fucking incredible tits under this, like, tight little top, like, leotard top thing under this coat. She's all down and bent over and, like, bitch slapping herself in the head and still doing manual field stresses on this gate area product where she says this guy that she was in love with and all that business there that said he was in love with her too except he was already engaged from priorly when they meet and fall vehemently in love. So there's all this back and forth and storm and drag business like that. And I'm lending the ear to her standing there. But finally she says, 
But finally the guy gets off the fence and finally says how he's surrendering to his love for this girl here with the tits and commits to her and says how he's going to go and tell this other girl in Tulsa where the guy lives that he's engaged to about this girl here and break it off in Tulsa and finally surrender and commit to this hysterical girl with the tits that loves him more than life herself and feels a merger of souls with him and all that violin business like that and felt like finally for Christ's sakes after all the one track shed heels she'd got the runaround from she finally she felt like here at last She's met a guy she could trust and love and merge souls with the sword of violins and hearts and fl A. And blah blah blah. R. Blah. And says off the guys goes flying back to Tulsa to finally break the engagement off with the prior girl like he committed he would and then fly right back to the arms of this girl standing with the Kleenex with the tits in Dayton here in the gate area with the waterworks crying out her eyes now to yours truly A. Oh like we can't see this coming R. Fuck you and that he puts his hand over his heart and all like that there and swears he's coming back to her and he'll be on that plane there with the flight number and time and she swears she'll be there with the tits to meet him and how she tells all her friends she's finally in love with the real thing and how he's breaking it off and coming right back and she cleans up her place for him to stay there when he comes back and gets her hair done up all big with spray like they do and dribbles perfume on her, you know, zones, and all that business like the usual story, and puts on her best pink jeans. Did I mention she's got on these pink jeans and heels that say fuck me in like myriad of major world languages? A. Eh? Heh <laughs> R. By this juncture now, we're in that little coffee shop thing, just in from the U.S. Air gates, that shitty one with no chairs that you have to, with your shitty two-dollar coffee, stand up at the tables with your stample case and bag all your shit on the low-end tile, not even thermoset of the floor they got that's already starting to curl at the groot and keep handing her Kleenexes and lend the ear and all that business. Thereafter, she vacuums out the car and even replaces the little freshener thing hanging off the rear view and hauls ass to be on time to the airport to meet the flight number. This so-called trustable guy swore on his fucking mother's life he'd be on. A. Guy's a shitheel from the old school. R. Shut up and that how she says how even... He called her. She gets the call right as she's smearing the last drib of perfume on her zone and gets her hair all sprayed out in directions like they do to haul ass to the airport. It rings, and it's this guy. And there's all this hiss and static on the phone, and she says, he says how he's calling from the sky is how romantically he puts it calling her in flight on the flight on that little in-flight phone you're supposed to slide your card through out of the back of the seat in front of you and saying how. A. The markup on those things go f six bucks a minute. It's a racket and all the surcharge raided out of the region you're flying over right then with a double spread if the region they say adjoins at the grid's design are but that's not the point do you want to hear this how the points this girl says she gets there early in the gate area greeting area and already with some of the waterworks already from love and violins of commitment finally and trust and stands, she says, all joy and trusting like a pathetic fool. She says while it gets in finally the flight, and we, they all, start herding, all in their big rush out the jetway thing. And he's not in the first wave out, and he's not in the second wave. How they come out in these little waves clumps like the things taking some kind of almost shit, you know? How? A. Jesus. I ought to...
the amount of fucking times I spend on jet are, and says like a pathetic, a total fool, her faith never faltering. She kept peering, gazing over the octoweave rope, maroon octoweave with that nice fox velvet, finish the rope of the area, over at the side, during all the hugging, and everybody meeting, or going off to baggage, and every time expecting this guy in the next wave out, clump, and then the next, and the next, and like that, waiting, a, poor little Mutsky, r, that then at the end there, I come off the last off as usual, and nobody else after except the crew pulling their little neat identical little bags, those neat little bags that always bug me somehow, and that's it, I'm the last, and she, a, so you're explaining it wasn't you that she's screaming and hitting the floor, it's just that you're the last of them off, and you're not this shit heel guy. The bastard even must have faked that call. The static, if you run your Remington, it makes static. That'll sound like a R. And I'm telling you, you never saw anybody, so the word heartbroken, you think, it's just words, blah blah. But then you see this girl with her hand knocking herself in the head for being such a fool, crying so hard she can't mostly breathe, and all that business. Like that hugging herself and rocking and slapping the shit out of the table so bad you have to lift the coffee off to keep it from knocking over and how men are shits and don't trust them all her friends said and she finally she met one she thinks she can finally trust to really give in and surrender and commit to do the right thing and they're right she's a fool men are just shit a eh? men mostly are shit you're right <laughs> are and I'm basically, I'm standing there holding coffee, I don't even, it's too late. I don't want even decaf, I'm lending the ear and my heart, I got to say it, my heart, going out a little bit to this girl for this heartbreak. I swear, kid, but you have never seen anything like this heartbreak on this girl with the tits. And I start telling her how she's right, the guy's a shit and don't even deserve, and how it's true most guys are shit, and how my heart's going out and all like that. A. Heh <laughs> heh. So then what happened? R. Heh <laughs> heh. A. Heh heh heh. R. You really got to ask? A. You bastard, you shit heel. R. Well, you know how it is, I mean, what are you going to do? A. You shit heel. R. Well, you know. B.I. number 30, 03 through 97. Drury U.T. I have to admit it was a big reason for marrying her, thinking I wasn't likely going to do better than this because of the way she had a good body even after she'd had a kid. Trim and good and good legs, she'd had a kid but wasn't all blown out and veiny and sagged. It probably sounds shallow, but it's the truth. I'd always had this major dread of marrying some good-looking woman, and then we have a kid and it blows her body out, but I still have to have sex with her because this is who I've signed on to have sex with the whole rest of my life. This probably sounds awful, but in her case, it was like she was pre-tested. The kid didn't blow her body out, so I knew she'd be a good bet to sign on and have kids with and still try to have sex. Does that sound shallow? Tell me what you think. Or does the real truth about this kind of thing always sound shallow, you know? Everybody's real reasons? What do you think? How does it sound? B.I. Number 31. 03 through 97. Roswell, G.A. But you want to know how to really be great? How your great lover really pleases a lady? Now. All your basic smoothie type fellows will always say they know. You're an authority and such. It's not a fag, darling. You have to hold it in. Most of these fellows, they haven't got the first damn idea how to really please a lady. Not really. A lot of them don't even care, to tell you the truth. That's your first type. Your Joe Six Pack Cracker type fellow there. Your basic pig. This fellow's barely even semi-conscious about life anyhow. 
and when it comes to love making, why he's just pure selfishness. He wants whatever he can get, and as long as he gets it, that's all there is to it, far as he's concerned. The type that rolls on and has at her, and the minute he comes, he rolls back off and commences to snoring. Go easy there. Why, I suppose this is your old-fashioned stereotype male fellow, older, the fellow that's been married twenty years and don't even know if the wife even ever comes, never thinks to even ask her. He comes, and that's all that counts far as he's concerned. Q. These aren't the fellows that I'm talking about. These are more like just animals, roll on and roll off, and that's all she wrote. Hold it closer to the end there, and don't inhale as much in as a regular fag. You want to hold it in and let it absorb. This is mine. I grow it. I got a room all lined with myler and lights, darling. You would not believe what it goes for down here. Those fellows are just animals. They're not even in the type of game we're talking about here. No. Because the ones we're talking about here are your basic secondary type of fellow, the fellow that thinks he's a great lover, and it's real important to these fellows that they think of themselves as great. This preoccupies a major block of their time, thinking they're great, and they know how to please her. These right here are your sensitive male smoothie type. Now. They're going to look like the complete opposite of your white trash fellow that don't even give a shit. That's it. But go easy. But now don't go thinking these fellows are really any better than your basic pigs are. Seeing themselves as great lover doesn't mean they give any more of a shit about her than the pigs do. And deep down, they aren't one little bit less selfish in bed. It's just with this type of fellow, what they get off on in bed is their own idea of themselves as a great lover, that can make the little lady just about lose her mind in bed. What they're into is a woman's pleasure and giving her pleasure. That's this type's whole trip. Q. Oh, like oh say, going down on her yin yang for hours on hours, holding off their own coming so they can keep at it for hours. Knowing the G spot and ecstasy posture and such, running down to Barnes and Nobles for all your latest female sexuality type books, so they can keep up on their knowledge about what's going on. I'm guessing from looking you over out here now, you've run up against a smoothie a time or two, with his pheromone aftershave and strawberry oil and hand massages, and the holding and touching. That know about the earlobe and what kind of flush means what, and the aureole, and the backside of the knee, and that new little ultra sensitive spot they say they found now just back of the G. This type of fellow knows them all, and you can be damn sure he's going to let you know he knows how to. Here, give it here. I'll show you. Well, and now, darling, you can just. But this type of fellow wants to know if she came, and how many times, and was it the best she ever, and like that. See there? When you blow out, you don't want to even be able to see anything. That means you got her all. I thought you said you did this before. This is not your average cracker ditch weed. It's like a notch on this fellow's gun for each time he can make her come. That's how he thinks about it. It's too damn good to go blowing half back out. It's like you got a Porsche and you're only driving it to church. No, he's a notcher, this fellow. That's a good way to compare them, maybe. The two types. Your pig might put a notch for every one they nail. That's their notches. They don't care. But your so-called great lover type fellow puts a notch for every time each one comes. But they're both of them just notchers. They're both really the same type fellow underneath. Their trip is different, but it's still only just their own trip they're on in bed, and the little lady deep down's going to feel like she's just getting used just the same. That's if the lady's got any sense at all. 
which is another story. And now, darling, when it goes down a little more, you take and don't grind it out with your boot there like you do a regular fag. You want to wet up your finger and gently pat the end of it and put it out and then save it. I got something to save them in. Me? I got something a little special. But your more run-of-the-mill is one of them little film canisters from the developer. That's how come nobody ever throws those out. See if you ever see you a little film canister thing in the trash someplace. Q. No, but here's your classic symptom to tell if it's one of these great lover fellows is they'll spend whole major blocks of time in bed going down on a lady's yin-yang over and over and making her come 17 straight times and such. But afterward, just watch and see if there's any way on God's good green earth he's going to let her turn around and go down on his precious little pizzle for him. How he'll go, oh no, baby, no, let me do you. I want to see you come again, baby. Oh, baby, you just lie there and let me work my love magic and such like that right there. Or he'll know all his special Korean massage shit and give her deep tissue back rubs or haul out the special black cherry oil and massage her feet and hands. Which, darling, I got to admit, if you never had a quality hand massage, you have not heretofore even really lived. Trust me. But will he let the little lady reciprocate and give him just even one back rub? No, sir. He will not. Because this type fellow's whole trip is he's got to be the one giving the pleasure here. Thank you, ma'am. See, it's different. It's got a screw lid with an airtight seal so it don't smell up your pocket. They're stinky little buggers. And then it goes right in this little flap thing here where why it could be anything at all. Because this is where your smoothie type is being stupid. This is what gives me my contempt for these fellows that go around thinking they're the Lord's own gift to the female species. Because at least your cracker type's halfway honest about it. They want to nail her and then roll off and that's all she wrote. Whereas, but your basic smoothie thinks he's all sensitive and knows how to please a lady just because they know clitoral suction and shy atsu and watching them in beds like watching one of these stupid-ass mechanics in white coats work on a Porsche all swelled up on their expertise and such. They think they're a great lover. They think they're generous in bed. No, but the catch is they're selfish about being generous. They're no better than the pig is. They're just sneakier about it. Now you're going to be thirsty. Now you're going to want some Evian. This shit'll dry out your mouth something fierce. I carry these little portable Evians with me in here in this inside part, see? Custom made. Go on and take one. You're going to want it. Go on. Q. Darling, no problem. Hang on to it. You're going to want some more in about half a minute. I could have sworn you said you did this before. I hope I'm not corrupting a Utah Mormon here, am I? Myler's better than foil. It reflects more of the light, so it all goes right into the plant. They got special seeds now where the plant don't get any higher than this here. But it's lethal. It's death on a cracker. Atlanta, in particular, seems full of these fellows. What they don't understand is their types, an even worse drag for a lady with any sense than your on-and-off pig ever was. Because how'd you like to just lie there and get worked on like a Porsche and never get to feel like you're generous and sexy and good in bed and a great lover too? Hmm? Hmm? That's where your smoothie type fellows always lose the game. They want to be the only great lover in the bed. They forget a lady's got feelings too. Who wants to lie there feeling all ungenerous and greedy while some yuppie with a Porsche shows off his tantric clouds and rain half lotus on you and mentally notching off how many times you come. If you swish it through a little, your mouth will stay wet longer. Envian's real good for that. Who cares if it's a dumbass yuppie water if it's good? Know what I mean? 
The thing to watch for is if the fellow, when he's going down on you, if he keeps one hand on the low part of your stomach, there to really make sure you're coming. Why? Then you'll know. Wants to make sure. The son of a bitch isn't a lover. He's just putting on a show. He doesn't give a shit about you. You want my opinion? You want to know how to really be great if you want to please her? That there's not one fellow in a thousand that's figured out. Q. Do you? Q. This secret is you got to both give the little lady pleasure and be able to also take it with equal technique to both an equal pleasure. Or at least you got to make her think so. Don't forget it's about her. Go on and eat her yin yang till she begs. Sure, go on. But also let her at your pizzle. And even if she's no prize at it, why you carry on and make her think she is. And like if her notion of a back rub's just some of those little pissant karate chops on your backbone. <laughs> why, you go on and let her. And you carry on like you never knew a karate chop could be like this. That's if a fellow wants to be a genuine great lover and go and think about her for one damn second. Q. Not on me, darling, no. I mean, I usually do, but I nibbled them up already, I'm afraid. The real fall down of these wannabe great type fellows is they think a lady is, when you come right down to it, dumb. Like all a lady wants to do is just lie there and come. Their real secret is, assume she feels the same way. That she wants to see herself as a great lover that can blow the top of a man's head clean off in bed. Let her. Put your picture of yourself on the goddamn back burner for once in your life. The smoothies think if they blow the little lady's head off, down there they got her. Bullshit. Q. But you're not going to just want one, though, darling. Trust me. There is a little mart thing a couple blocks if we... Whoa. Watch your... Q. No, you go on and make her think she's blowing your damn head off. That's what they really want. Then you really and truly got her. If she thinks you'll never forget her. Never ever. You follow? B.I. number 36, 05 through 97. Metropolitan Domestic Violence Community Outreach, Counseling, and Service Center Annex, Aurora, Illinois. So I decided to get help. I got in touch with the fact that the real problem has nothing to do with her. I saw that she would forever go on playing victim to my villain. I was powerless to change her. She was not the part of the problem I could, you know, address. So I made a decision to get help for me. I now know it was the best thing I've ever done and the hardest. It hasn't been easy, but my self-esteem is much higher now. I've halted this shame spiral. I've learned forgiveness. I like myself. Q. Who? End of chapter 4. Thank you for listening. This was Young Yosef at your service. It helps a lot if you subscribe and encourages me when you like the video. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.